So while we're getting our presentation up, we'd like to wish everybody a happy National Gingerbread Day. We just we just <laughs> found out that you know it's something we all have in common. Hopefully, we all like gingerbread. As so. a good segue to physical therapy, why did the gingerbread man go to physical therapy? Oh, that's a good one too. We'll put that on the board. <laughs> he, he was feeling crummy, but he should ice his knee. <laughs> Both are acceptable answers. <laughs> good answer, though. Very good. I like answer. that. Good one. All right. Thank you guys so much for inviting us to the Bobby Jones CSF family. That was very warm, and you guys are really going in a great direction. It's great to be part of the momentum that you guys have created, and uh, it's great to be a part of. And you guys are going about it the right way with science and with support and taking it to to the hill. So that's. That's great. Keep it up. Yeah, we appreciate you um, inviting us here, and uh, it's an honor. I'm, I've already learned a lot, so thank you, Roman. Yeah. It's very good. It's good research. Keep it up. Can't wait to see it. Shoot it out to us. All right, so exercising within our boundaries. So everyone else has their own. As Roman says, the spectrum of presentations are no one's the same in this room. So going out as a physical therapy approach, everyone's going to have their own. We're going to hit a big target on how to hit everybody and way to go to as a resource to the physical therapist so you can share your journey your specific needs and hopefully they can you can give them the insight uh, we learn the most from our patients and our her family uh, Kristen so before that I would like to say I was well read on EDS and the CSF issues um, I, I would be lying to you the the most knowledge that I learned was through her experiences and using our PT knowledge in collaboration with her and her needs to really grow with with what we're helping her family and, and you guys with as well so this is a, a good picture of someone being outside their boundaries I would say let's let's we're not the population to be doing this right now uh, but some of the most ex best uh, yoga probably have EDS they're doing extreme things that not a lot of us can do. But if you do it strong when within their boundaries, I'm not saying it's wrong to do, but you have to make sure you're strong before you go in and attempting that. I would urge just not to do that, but maybe you can. All right, so first we like to hit it as a exercise, as physical therapy is very important. I know we've all heard this. If we could uh, all do this, it would be, it'd be great. So regular exercise helps prevent the whole gamut of health issues. Uh, we're talking from stroke, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, depression, anxiety, some of the things that are getting all of us, um, even without conditions as such, uh, and reducing our, uh, falls and reducing arthritis. Uh, it can also help with cognitive function as well as all risk of death. So that's, that's pretty important things to do, right? Just go out and exercise. It's easy, right? Um, it's also... Improves your mood, who doesn't want that? Uh, controls weight, I don't like to use this as purely as, as a weight issue, but it does help control it. Uh, but I think it puts you in a better frame of mind. Uh, boosts your energy, improves your social life. There's kids here that said something else, but social life it helps with as well. Uh, it also increases your fun, it can be a social avenue for you. So just getting out to the public and working out and being with the community, it's, it's a really impactful thing. Um, and the recommendations from the uh, ACSM, the, the guidelines that we should all follow, uh, you know, exercising three times a week. The intensity is different with moderate exercise. You don't have to go as hard, uh, like riding your bike or cutting the grass. Uh, more vigorous exercise is running, sprints, uh, really hardcore biking, mountain biking, things at that intensity. Uh, you know, all you have to do is, you know, moderate exercise 150 minutes a week. Yeah, why not? It's easy to do in your guys' condition. Uh, and the vigorous exercise, at least 60 minutes a week. So so we, we should start with the fact that so we're, we're giving the research-based recommendations for the general population. And we're, we're throwing these out as a reference and something to shoot for. Um, but really, part of our purpose is not to just regurgitate the, these numbers to give them as a reference, but to realize that, that the population um, with these related disorders has such uh, variability, and, um, and, and following these and thinking these are what you have to do is, is really not what we're looking at. We're, we're kind of saying this might be a goal, this is something to shoot for, this is the norm, um, but we're also really here to talk about um, what are the variations and what part, how can you get there yeah. and is really these recommendations, is this really where you need to be personally? So we want, to, we want to acknowledge the variability and how you can kind of work toward your personal goals. 
And that's kind of what I have a slide. It's a magical thing. That's all you have to do. Just work out three or four, five, 20 times a week, and you're fine. You guys don't have any issues with that, right? Just go out there. It's easy. It's hard, it's hard for us all. So these guidelines seem pretty impossible, but we're they're not impossible, but they're, they're good overall goals to go with, says the research. But being in clinical and treating the population, it's very difficult. There's so many barriers, and especially you guys have some curveballs. So a couple of the complications and barriers that we run into with the population like you guys have, um, joint hypermobility and instability. So we just can't get you running, sprinting, and think you're going to be okay just right away. So, you know, loose joints, we have to keep that in mind. Uh, the neural tension from the Chiari and the syrinx, that plays a big role in all your extremities, and so it's a lot harder. So it's the nerve tightness, we'll call it. So when you go to your physical therapist, I want you to show them, it's like, yes, I'm, I'm tight here, but I can, how come I can reach my foot back here because I'm hypermobile, but I'm tight everywhere. How am I tight and loose at the same time? So there's differences of what's tight and tell you where to kind of be. And then we also have to have a factor of your automatic nervous system. Basically, why is my heart rate spike when I just stand up? Why is my blood pressure going crazy? So how to control all these variables inside you and having your physical therapist help you monitor it and kind of gauge where you need to be. Uh, then we also have nociception and centralization. Uh, that's how your body, your brain body pain kind of processes and, and matches each other. So that's it, that's all we have to work on when you come to PT, it's a piece of cake. <laughs> So we're going to kind of help you when you go to your physical therapist to kind of say, you know, am, am I in too much motion when I'm doing this? Like I said, some people are strong enough. I'd say that gentleman all the way over is going to dislocate a hip. Okay, so it's not, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it. But if they need to get there, I don't know why that lady needs to almost step on her head. I don't know. But some people in different sports, that's where they need to attain to be. But I would, I just want you to get a general awareness of your body. And you guys seem to be pretty in depth, but I think you guys got to teach other people as well because um, you be aware of your body position. It's like, how do I know where my body position should be? And that's something you should bring to your physical therapist. So I'm going to kind of help you shoot a couple things by. Um, the hypermobility test. So this is what Airless Download Society came out with this. And if you ever saw the doctor like go like this to you, see how much your hi elbow hyperextends, your knees hyperextend, can you touch the floor? And you're like, check, check, check. That's a generalized condition. You don't have to have all of these to be hypermobile. If you just see somebody walk around with their knees overlocked out, they can just be a loose knee. But they all need to know the same things that you guys are going through is don't lock that knee out. Uh, preserve the joint. Right now, you're, you're getting in these positions because it's, it's less energy. It's just easy for me to kind of just stand right here. And over years, that hip's just going to get looser and looser and looser. And that's just not going to be good for you. But what does it do? If you're standing all day, it takes a little bit of energy out of there. You guys are full of energy, right? You guys don't lose energy quickly or get tired. There's not a lot of pain. So these are ways you're compensating just to try to get by, but they're not always great for your body. I'm not saying don't ever do it because it's just like telling a person not to crack their knuckles a thousand times. You tell them not to do it, you're like, I need to do it more. <laughs> so so it's not throwing those things at you to never be in these positions, but try to avoid staying in them. Don't stay there. Um, and I'm just going to go through a couple positions that your you know, physical therapist will help you say, like you ever see somebody standing with their knee locked out like that? Over time, we're going to break down. That knee is going to get looser and looser and looser. That's kind of when that kneecap subluxes. Does anybody have that subluxing, subluxing kneecap where it just shoots out? Yeah. You know, you'll, 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 you'll be in there. For, for, I know it's hard because that's where the knee easily goes, but uh, we're going to try to teach, the physical therapist should try to teach you where to kind of be where that joint isn't going to just lose contact with your knee. So, so the right position is going to cause the, a little bit of muscle tension, but without wiping you out, because it's very energy demanding. So an another, I, I have to say, I was trying not to eavesdrop, but I was listening, and I kind of heard, overheard a conversation about, you know, your one, I know you weren't talking about us, but your wonderful PT. Um, so part of this talk also is we want to include some advice into how to find um, the right PT. Um, if you've experienced a lot of PT, you might realize that there is going to be differences in variety in um, in the PT population, um, but not just finding the, the right one, but being able to talk, so there may be, it may not be it's the wrong PT, there may be just some issues with communication, and so um, maybe share some, some ideas on how it would be appropriate kind of to share your story with your PT to, to, be, to make the PT a little bit more compatible. 
And the piece that I would say with this is um, the first thing hopefully you don't hear is just don't do that. And we're like shaking our fingers and <laughs> I, it's hard to not do that. I understand. It's hard to, I don't lock your knee out. This is just where it goes. It's, it's so much harder. So that is a, a PT who does understand that, a, a health practitioner that understands that and can help you find ways to um, seek more stable positions in a way that doesn't just destroy your energy, that doesn't just um, kind of make you feel guilty for when you do fall back oh into gosh. those rocking joints. I feel like I'm so naughty, right? But I can't help myself. <laughs> it's not your fault and we're not going to scold you for it. So, you know, start with somebody that's not going to yell at you and shake their finger. That, that's my first piece of advice and finding a good PT. I do have Although people, let's say, <laughs> every time I do that, I think of you, Trav. I'm like, oh, Travis wouldn't like that. I was like, why do I got to be the bad guy? Yeah. But uh, at least they're doing it. But I'd rather be a little bit prettier in the picture and not so, like, I'm not out of my hammer to like, lay down the law. Um, so other positions, very well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Just the communication with your therapist. And if you don't have a, a relationship with a therapist, it may not be work out. They could be the, the greatest they want. But if they don't understand your story, you, I think you guys are pros at looking until you, you find the right one and, and, and talking to the group and getting some, some implements. But if you don't, bring these as a resource to them. Not, this isn't like a fight hard cookie cutter protocol. It's like, do this to me. I mean, we don't, we don't know. I mean, everyone's so different. So I wish there was like week one, we'll be doing this. Week two, next. I wish. Uh, unfortunately, we're just built a little bit more dynamic than that. Week 10, you're better. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go run that six miles now. Uh, like I showed earlier, that hip going out to the side, we all do it, we all do it, but just try to keep that in as low as possible. Sitting, we haven't even actually sitting. I, I'm guilty of these two, but don't stay there. You're allowed to get there, you're allowed to get, just keep moving around, and I'm a big ADD mess, I'm always squirming and moving, so it's good that I have a job, I don't have to sit still. But you guys may, you guys have to get, you know, be aware of that. So the standing postures, oh my gosh, there's so many, there's only one ideal, there's only one way to be the right one. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's exactly one way to be, but I just want to avoid staying in them. So most of my uh, hypermobility people are in the sway back. So the, the fourth one over the yellow and the one all the way to the right. Those are positions that's going to throw those hips out, throw that back out, the head's forward, the knee's hyperextending. So that's our kneecap subluxation. That's our hip being too loose in the socket, pop, pop, pop everywhere we go. Lumbar, I'm sure we have a couple spines that... Uh, are fused in here so we spinal spinal instability is very huge and I wish there was a recipe that we could avoid surgeries I have a lot of people coming in I just want to avoid t6 through t10 being fused and that's my you know that's our, that's our goal so uh, it's, these are great goals there isn't a, a beautiful way to do it there's so many different techniques I'm not going to tell the, a, a physical therapist what to do because I mean I dry needle he uses muscle energy technique. We usually do a little bit of both, but that's more of a physical therapy. But you guys are shaking your head. You guys know the muscle energy techniques, and then, then through it all, the dry needling. So find out what works. Cupping, I heard, was great. Um, they don't have to be certified. But certain. You, yeah, you'd like them to be. But I'm not, but it was like, uh, I, don't, I was taught by someone who's certified. So it's, it's not something you have to. You have to be certified to do dry needling, though. Because you got to think, what if, if something goes wrong? Dry needling, something can go wrong. Suction cups, bad bruise for too long a time. I don't like bruising, especially with uh, your population. Over over bruising, I'd say it's going to set up uh, a bad set. You guys bruise easily enough. Put it on there lightly. Move it around. Don't go till it's purple. Just get that. Um, the true cupping comes. I didn't know I was going to get here. Yeah. Uh, Middle Eastern, where we're Tangent. we're pulling out blood. I mean, you just taking out the toxins. As a physical therapist, we shouldn't be doing that. We might be. The other other old days, it'd be a hot cup. You light it, cut it on fire, and Boxy make Boxy. an incision and bleed them. We're causing myofascial decompression. We're just trying to lift layers off. Because what happens is you, the, the joints are, are loose, the muscles are still tight, the nerves are still tight. You need to stretch that out. I like the foam rolling, massagers. Don't stretch muscles. Your joints are going to go before you ever stretch your muscles, unfortunately. But you feel tight. I feel tight. I feel tight but your joints win. They just go before you get to that muscle. So that's why you like the massagers, the rollers, safely, safely. Um, and now once we get into exercising, just stay away from 
the knees going together. Like I said, it's another way to save energy and just to rely on your joints. You're just crushing the knees as you do that. We get more bowing, more patellar subluxations. Uh, spinal stability all the way to the right. We round that back, we're in trouble. We arch that back, we're in trouble. So we're like, I don't know what my back's doing. Why well, you need a good physical therapist to tell you what it feels like to be where you need to be. Find that sweet spot. Because, um, you know, I don't know what I look like. Somebody's like, you're rounding your back, Travis. Like, I feel good. I can't, see, you can't see yourself all the time. So it's good to have uh, that awareness of yourself. I can't, a lot of your dancers can. I'm not, I'm not talented or, or, or blessed with that talent. Um, another spinal stability here. See the plank. He's arching his back. It's just a recipe for that slipping. That, you know, if those loose ligaments are just not gonna, I don't care how strong you are, that's gonna hurt your back. Um, and also overhead pressing, that arching in the back. Um, a lot of my early stainless, you got that shoulder that can go way back here. A lot of crossfitters, that shoulder goes back there. Oh, just, I'll be, I'll be seeing them. So be careful, Mike. Watch those hyperextended elbows now. <laughs> All right, so why do I feel this way? So another issue with the syrinx and the carimar formation, we have a pinching of the nerve somewhere in your spinal canal. Uh, so many ways that this can manifest. So everybody has a different presentation. Um, we aren't in the business of fixing that. You do need surgery if they're bad enough. But what we can do is do it on the periphery, okay? Spinal cord we can make strong, uh, but to stretch it, we have to go to the outer system. So just all the nerves out and fr um, from beyond, okay? So for there's the stretch from the neck, it branches. You got three major nerves that goes down each arm. And there's a little way to kind of stretch them each way. Now I want to be very careful with everyone's elbow who hyperextends when you try to go out there. So we have to, the joints are first. Then we stretch everywhere else that we're in a safe zone for, so we're not overdoing it, okay? So we got a couple of these guys without dislocating a, a ulnar nerve there too. So just kind of give, give that, so if you're having arm symptoms or tightness, sometimes we can create slack in that system wherever we can. It's already being taken up within the spine, but wherever we can draw from it without doing surgery, let's, let's try that at least. Um, down the leg, you get that sciatica. Well, you guys can have a tight sciatic nerve without having the sciatica. Uh, a little way is that, that slumped nerve glide. You know, slump over, we kick. For those who are not fused, slump as much as you can. Uh, but it's really important was that that leg kick, kick and the ankle uh, pump. And that's gonna help not let you have sciatica, but it's also gonna keep, like, I got a tight hamstring, I got a tight hamstring. But you can touch your palm to the ground, it's not your hamstring. So it's a lot of the nerve involvement. Um, this one's in the front, so if you see that blue, the picture all the way over there, the blue and the red, those will be the symptoms in the front of your thigh. There's more nerves down into the foot, but I just try to give you the big nerves, the two big nerves, one in the front, one in the back. Just be careful. I, didn't, I hesitated putting this one on, that a lot of people arch their back. And so remember the planks, the back dropped? Just kick an ab, extra ab um, contraction in there as well, and then, and then do the stretch. Too many times I cause that low back that we're trying to, you know, we got the back fixed, now we gotta get the nerve loose, and then, oh, I hurt my back again, I love that stretch. It's like, all right, so, you know, whenever possible, we're gonna turn off our core. So I'm a big core advocate of kicking that in. So if I can jump in, just, so we're talking about um, neuro, neurodynamic kind of exercises. So just to kind of back up a little bit and just talk about, um, so we said we're not gonna cure a syrinx, right? But, um, but we have, we all have central nervous systems and we all have peripheral nerves. And, um, and with the syrinx, there's gonna be alteration in that whole system. Um, the dura of our spinal cord, the connective tissue of our spinal cord is continuous with the peripheral nerves. So we have this continuous nervous connective tissue throughout our system. And when something goes wrong, those nerves can become more sensitive um, and in a sense that sensitivity, increased sensitivity means any kind of tension will cause either pain or the, that feeling of extreme tightness or a, an inhibition to move in certain ways. And so these are specific ways of trying to get dynamics and more uh, and to make that nerve tissue more normal. We're not stretching it, we're making nerves healthier by um, putting tension on and off of them in a way that cumulatively kind of takes up the, the stretch throughout your system. Um, and so by having these uh, having these techniques and then being able to find the right intensity and combination to work to work with you is kind of the point of all these neurodynamic exercises in the PT realm. Yeah, thanks Mark. Very, 
very good the tensioning. So this isn't a nerve stretch. Nerves don't stretch, they're wires. Uh, we are pulling them through your whole system, so good point. So when you're like, oh yeah, I feel that, my hand's numb, this is great, no, no, no. <laughs> we get back it down, these don't, these don't stretch. I want you to feel, the, like you said, the tension. And we put it on, we turn it off. And I do it myself, and when I go there, it's like, woo, I can't feel this very good, and it's like still numb, you're, you're done for the day. That's it, because it will irritate. And you're like, I don't know what I did, I'm, I'm, I can't sleep. What did I, oh, your nerves remembered what you did to it in the day. If it doesn't bother you then, it will, you know, at night. When you go to rest, you turn it off, it's like, oh, my hand's on fire. So a nice, gentle tension. So um, from my experience working with the, the Means family, there's, there's only a green light. It's just go. Let's just, let's just stretch this thing. Let's go. It's like, no, no, no. I was like, I was okay. I couldn't sleep. But I felt like it was looser. I was like, no, no. <laughs> so I've, I've made my errors, and I'm, I'm passing it on to you guys. So this one's very, very, you, like, I don't even feel like I'm doing anything. Because you're, you're going to seek that feedback. That's why we're, you're in those hyperextended positions, because that's a lot of feedback. It feels good. I'm cracking the knuckles. You, your body's searching for that feedback, that, that, that input. And we, it's just excessive sometimes once you get your end ranges. So it's going to be hard. Don't stay there. Oh, man, I'm, I do have some nerve issues, too. <laughs> I'll be on, on, the, on the docket tomorrow. I got you. PT. <laughs> All right, so now I like to go over the joints. That was loose. The nerves were tight. Now it's time to kind of exercise. So there's a whole gamut of exercises that they're out there. So I'm not going to uh, preach one in particular, but I'd say start where you are. Find your baseline. Um, I haven't worked out in a little bit. My baseline just went down. I can't go back. Well, I was a senior in high school. I could no. That's what's going to get us in trouble. Go with where you are now. Um, start slow. Monitor your symptoms. Um, in this you know population, we have to be very mindful. I, like, I, could, I could do that the other day. Why am I getting a headache right now? Why am I? Why is my blood? heart rate going crazy right now. It's just where you are in that time. You gotta find your baseline. You gotta start with low intensity, low duration, low resistance. So we just start one at a time. And it's like, all right, I felt pretty good after that day. Let me add, a, add five more minutes onto my bike, but not go harder for that five minutes. Just stay that same intensity. Uh, so you're gonna have to, you're gonna know how you feel, but you, you guys can't introduce it to it so fast. Uh, you guys will pay for it longer, unfortunately. Um, and of course, check with your doctor before doing any exercise for everybody always says that right I, I think you've talked to your doctors and your doctors are always urging you probably to exercise you're like easier said than done just follow recommendations right five times a week at 50 percent of vigorous activity not that easy right so develop a plan um and so look at all these activities um even you know driving burned 110 calories. So this isn't a calorie base, I'm just saying that the low intensity is doing something. You are accumulating, doing a little bit and start jumping into the moderate to the extreme and just work your way up slowly. Like I did a few of these, you know, these things can also, the way uh, Kristen Thompson and Mike weight lifts, I'm sure it doesn't fall into uh, significant. I'm sorry, it's probably extreme. <laughs> but for every, it's all how you handle it. You can do any activity and go to the extreme. I'm just jealous. <laughs> All right. So while we're working out, I love the smart watches. I saw a lot of people with the app or the or the uh, heart rate monitors. It's super huge. The body doesn't always tell you it's not doing well, but where we got to look for and there's there's they're getting better science to it. They're finding the link between your heart rate and your body system going haywire before you start feeling it. So by the time your body feels it, it is too late sometimes. So I like to use, you know, if we could all just work out, I'm gonna go 70 to 80% and get my aerobic zone. It's like, well, that may be way too much for you guys because this is age and gender-based norms. Well, that's of the population that, you know, doesn't have these autonomic nervous system issues. So this is ideal, just hit the, you know, 140s. Like I get that to standing sometimes, right? So you're yeah, sitting. So not for you. I gave you the, the specific charts. Not going to go through that. Not, not that it's not important, but we have, we have something called POTS that to, to consider. Okay? So every time you step up, it's uh, 40 milligrams of mercury increase. So your blood pressure just goes up at least 40 every time you stand. Is that symptomatic? Sometimes. And so how are you going to exercise when the pot springs up all these other secondary effects. So tachycardia means your heart rate goes up. So that's already when I would say your body needs you to, to take it easy a little bit. Don't blast through these. Don't blast through them. Sorry, I wasn't. <laughs> She's a pro. 
So like I said, it has to be individualized. We all have smarter technology. The wearables, te let's use them. All right, it's like, how would I do this myself? You would start off with, they all have the resting heart rate. Go from resting heart rate, and where are you today? Somebody could be flaring up. I'm having a bad episode today. Not the day to, to, to crank. That, blood, that heart rate's gonna spike really, really quick. Maybe we take it easy today. Maybe you're at your baseline. Not feeling 100%, but good. When are you guys 100%, right? So maybe you're at your baseline. We'll call that baseline. Um, and then stand up. That thing shoots through the roof. You could do the exercises as much as you can laying down or in a chair. Doing something is better than nothing, and that builds on a day. On a bad day, I was still able to do this program. That's a win. On a good day, I was able to do this program. That's a win. Let's have more wins than losses, because we're going to listen to our body. We're going to stay out of the, the nerve stretches, the hypermobility. Easier said than done. But we're going to try. We're going to try. And so, you know, get your heart rate. That's the mathematical, scientific heart rate calibration, which you should be in. It's great in science. Uh, when, when you come in, this is kind of what I do, um, non-scientific way. It is science, but it's, it's N of one. You know what I'm talking about, N of one, person of one, sample one. How are you going to do? Um, slowly progress it. Um, you become symptomatic, check your heart rate. So usually we have about like 130, let's say. Oh, I, stay, I get doing anything. It hits 130, I got a headache, or I become lightheaded, I become foggy. All right, well, 130 is your trigger point. You gotta, you gotta go 120. 120 is not much. Well, it's a lot more laying on your ground. You can get that heart rate up to 120 pretty good. Increase the intensity, maybe set up. Maybe we're doing a little bit more sitting. Then finally progress up to standing. On a bad day, you can do a whole lot. You may not feel like it. You're allowed to take the day off. But don't take every day that week off. One day, we're going to get back on it Tuesday. Going to get back at it. Just a little bit. And build, build, build as much as you can. So as you start getting better and better, it's like, all right, I hit 130 by accident because I pushed it a little bit. You guys would never do that. Felt good, asymptomatic, I'm doing okay that day. I could bump it up to 140 until we're kind of in these sweet spots where you have control that day. Now sometimes stress might throw you off, but you know, you just gotta get back on to the culture and work your way back to these zones as soon as your symptoms are at bay or until you can do a big exercise program without so much. And so as you go, you go, you know, I look at the, the scale to the left all the time. I did a, you know, very, very light exercise. That's you're having a rough day. Slowly go back up until it's a little bit harder. Then once you're straight in, ready to lock in, it's like, I know my one RM is one rep max. So you lift 100 pounds as one time. When you stay into the 50% of the one rep max, you do more reps of that. So this is the scientific part. I hope your PTs would help you guide that. But some of you guys are... You have a lot of knowledge about your body, so you might be able to, to incorporate that yourself. And so the recommendations I said at the beginning now become a goal, like Mark was saying. This becomes a goal. This is what try to attain to. I'd like to attain to it too, but this is what you're kind of work, we're all working for to get the health benefits overall. And then I love the core. So a lot of us have the spinal stability issues. Uh, start. This could be too much. Start simple. But we need the muscles in the front of your core and the back of your core to kick in to help preserve that joint mechanics so we're not overdoing it. We're staying safe, safe zones. Uh, this has no extension and no rotation in it. That's a great place to start. And maybe always stay, depending on your, your level. Uh, but if you're ready to, to climb the, the higher ladder, that's, that's a little bit more. You have to have so much more control. Caution, there is rotation and an extension in that because we need to be in safe, controlled ranges. These aren't bad if we're in control of it. And I, you know that's when you need to. And I did research on that, so that's why I had a, 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 a shameless plug. I always has a plug. I don't have a book out yet, but I will now. Um, and so these are your goals, your, phys your, your personal achievement goals, but then there's also your physical therapy goals. And so Mark's going to kind of chime in about the kind of goals as a physical therapist. So yeah, and, and part of this is trying to look for a PT that might be sensitive to your needs. One thing that you might look for is if they're using measures that are specific for you. So the general population, we have these outcomes measures. There's questionnaires, you know, that usually have like a one to five scale that you have to or you check off one of the boxes. And these are useful and valid, but a lot of times uh, they have a ceiling or a floor effect where um, you specifically might, it might not capture your level of function or disability and be sensitive to the change that you would, that you would capture in physical therapy. So uh, this is one thing to look for that is, that is um, proven to be valid and specific for 
the person in front of you. Um, so patient specific functional scale is based, it's asking you what are the things that you can't do that you want to do? What are, what are your daily challenges and can you rate those? And by having this kind of outcome measure it really does help to once show that your therapist is specifically thinking about what you want to accomplish in PT and in your life. Um, and two, they're going to use valid measures that will help us to be able to justify treating you for the amount of time you need. Insurance companies don't like to uh, extend care for too long. And so having some, some numbers and some valid measures on our side is really helpful. So uh, speaking of uh, these kind of goals, one of the goals when we ask, if I ask anybody Almost anybody who walks in the door, what's your goal of coming to physical therapy? And I always sort of say, just don't say to have no pain, <laughs> right? So everybody's goal is to, to get rid of the pain. Um, but that's not really a functional goal. It's, it's a little tougher to measure. It's, it's obviously quite subjective. Um, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, and it doesn't mean it's not worth uh, addressing. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, pain and the experience of pain, um, kind of I'm pointing out a, a textbook that um, I teach from and, um, and to point out that pain science is a very quickly, rapidly um, evolving um, science. So evidence-based medicine involves understanding pain science and what we can do about it. And so real in quickly introductory, I just want to point out that it is pain is the number one reason for seeking medical attention. And uh, there are 100 million adults that suffer from chronic pain. And that, if you combine uh, people with diabetes, cancer, and heart disease combined, um, there are more people in chronic pain. So obviously, it's a, a very high population, a very significant um, problem in society. And those are higher in um, lower socioeconomic um, status people, lower education and unemployed. Um, it is not uh, affected by race and ethnicity, but um, it often is seen um, because of the um, socioeconomic and, um, status. So I hate reading from, from slides, but I am going to read the definition of pain to you because I want you to think about it and hopefully, um, hopefully think about it in a new perspective. So um, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with the actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of tissue damage. The, points I wanna, the parts I want to point out is, yes, of course it's sensory, but it's emotional. Um, it's an experience, and it's not just tissue damage, but potential tissue, tissue damage. So my definition of pain is the brain and body's response to perceived threat. We experience pain not because tissue is damaged, not because something's broken. It's because our brain and body have found that there's something wrong, and it's giving you a message to try and protect yourself. The problem is, is that it doesn't always go the way things plan. So understanding pain from the perspective that, that it is a, an experience, it's not, it's not just nerves firing off and telling your brain something. Okay, so um, sometimes when I try and explain that and I say pain is in the brain, um, I get back, oh, so you're telling me it's all in my head. And, and I wanna say yes, but it's all in everyone's head, right? That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. It's not, I'm not saying your pain is because you're crazy. I'm saying us understanding pain is an, an experience. It's, it's, it's a culmination of what our nerves are telling us, what our past experiences are, the safety of our environment, um, the, state, the state we're in in general. It's a culmination of all these things. And so, yes, it's in the brain, but yes, it's also very real. And we want to um, acknowledge that everybody's experience is unique, um, and we're not just saying it's in your head, we're trying to address it from every aspect of science that we possibly can. And so, the components of pain that, are, that go wrong, um, often go wrong because um, we have a sense of higher threat. If our, if our sense of threat is through the roof, um, then we're gonna experience more pain. So some of the things that could cause that are increased stress, 
um, getting diagnoses from six different doctors, getting six different diagnoses, one telling you you're going to get better, one telling you you, um, you have one diagnosis or the other diagnosis. We probably have all of them, right? Good chance. Um, but, but getting differences in opinion and different prognoses and what can be done about it is very stressful and can raise your thought, your idea of threat to your body. General, generalized fear of anxiety, the fact that um, your, your very livelihood might be threatened by your own disability because of these conditions that, that you may have. So what can we do about that? We, we can do a lot, actually. And um, how's that for a complicated picture? Um, so I, I took this snapshot out of a um, journal article because it is a, a visual um, shot of a patient with fibromyalgia. Um, these are slices of the brain. It's a functional MRI, so the red is active spots. I'm not going to try and um, tell you every detail of it, but, um, but the first block is the patient doing an exercise, and you can see the, and that's them experiencing pain as they uh, as they do that. The second is after they've been trained for a while, and the difference between the second and the third block is is the only difference is that patient has had two and a half hours of pain neuroscience education, and by understanding pain, they're brain firing, the biggest difference um, I can, if I can point out, and the, the final block is really kind of in a, the difference between two and three. So the, the largest, this largest blip here in the difference between two and three is in the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, the area, one of the areas that's really um, responsible for processing pain. And so the, if the difference between doing the exact same activity if the only difference is pain neuroscience education and the largest place that changed in the brain is the, pay, plain, uh, the pace that, place that processes pain and their experience of pain, it's, it's a nice visual way of showing and supporting other research that shows that pain neuroscience education can significantly decrease a patient's experience of pain. So. Um, that's one component, um, lessons in pain. Other things we can do is, is explore all the aspects of pain. So pain neuroscience education is a, is a flashy term for educating your patient about pain and actually changing their sense of threat. And so the first lesson to decrease their sense of threat is to realize that pain does not equal tissue damage. So how many people have had uh, yes, you have a dislocation. Yes, you tear something. That's acute pain. Your body is, is uh, experiencing inflammation, nociception, messages of pain. That's, that's acute pain. Um, but when you're six months out, three months out, and you still have pain, or the pain actually feels worse, and it's spread in different areas, that's not acute pain. That is your um, processing gone, gone wrong. And the first thing that you can, one of the things that you can do is when you realize that my tissue, I'm not broken. I'm, not, I'm unbreakable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not broken. You tattoo. Um, uh, realizing that and knowing that you know this is a processing thing I can I can change my perception um, and start to influence that other things we can do is actually change our own endorphin we, we started off talking about exercise exercise is great for you well exercise also will uh, do you have a oh, you're stretching yes. it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm always ready to to take questions. Um, so, so we're exercising, we're changing our endorphins. Our, part of our experience of pain is the balance of how our pain, um, our, our neurotransmitters are balancing and t giving us messages in our brain. So having more, um, uh, more of our own natural painkillers with exercise, exercise is the way to get that accomplished. Yeah, if I could say. Yeah. yeah. Like, like working on that balance of exercise does cause you soreness the next day if we do it correctly, but how do we balance that soreness from you know the, the hypersensitivity? So there is a balance. We want the good chemicals that way, the bad chemicals, but if we overdo it with exercise, those bad chemicals will outweigh us, and that's when we are free flared up from exercise. So you want a controllable amount, slow graded exercise program to balance the bad chemicals from the good chemicals. So if we win that balance, we have a good day. We have a good day. So 
that's easier said than done because we're going to overdo it at times. But we're going to learn from that. It's like, oh, that that I overdid it that day. That's my lesson. And then that's how I didn't break. I didn't break anything that day. I just overdid it. So that's kind of the big. That's how we perceive it. Now, like, oh, there goes. I need another surgery, which will probably be the first thing that comes in your head when you wake up in the morning, and that is hurting again. It's like, oh no, another one. So if we keep a good positive mindset and and how we perceive it. Now, if it really it does need surgery, then you got to go. But when you first wake up, you got to set a positive positive mindset. Sorry. So um, so speaking of balance, um, that's another area that we can control our, our pain. So uh, our autonomic nervous system. We we know you have. There's a lot of um, uh, conditions that we've kind of touched on that are really talking about dysregulation of our of our autonomic nervous system and so um, part of another aspect of decreasing chronic um, persistent pain is by balancing your fight or flight versus your kind of rest and digest uh, portions of our, our nervous system so um, just things like mindfulness and meditation and breathing exercises um, are things that can be helpful um, and finally, CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. We are not, um, that is outside of our realm, we're not therapists, but we're interprofessional practitioners and we deal with other professions. And a lot of the research that, that shows that changing and, and neuroeducation and changing your mindset can actually significantly change your pain experience has been um, based on cognitive behavioral therapy. So um, we certainly want to mention that. So, uh, pain is complex. This is from a neuromatrix theory of, of what pain is. It's kind of a visual. We have a sensory component that, um, that t that's our nociceptors and nerves telling us that we have pain. But we have a motivational affective component. That's how we respond to pain. That's how our nervous system and our motor system responds behaviorally. We have a cognitive and evaluative component of pain. So. Um, the, the point of thinking of pain in this kind of complex way is that we actually have techniques and, and um, processes that address every component of pain. Um, and that's why we do encourage an interprofessional approach to, to addressing your um, cr chronic pain conditions. I think we're a little over, but as a, to, to wrap up, basically we have to try to get on a schedule. We've got to start that habit. We've got to start one time in a day. You can't go out there and be a weekend warrior and like, oh, I wasn't doing anything for a while, but then I just did a pickup basketball game and I couldn't wake up for three days. So, and that's that's literally can happen. So, just got to go slow, stick to a schedule. Sometimes it's worth it though. Sometimes you got to play paintball. Sometimes you got to do it because it's it's all about what is it worth the soreness? Is it with the quality of life? That's we're all talking about quality of life. You're going to have some discomfort, you're going to have pain, but have that balancing act of when it's worth it. I, I, I wouldn't mind, you know, go ahead, if it's worth it. Now, if it's not worth it, then behave, no. Um, so just do as much as you can, no matter what the day brings you. It's a lifelong condition. So you need a lifelong approach. That's not just one big day, I'm gonna nail it, get it all. You gotta live it, you're gonna fall. You gotta get, gotta get back up. I need to do it too, I don't always work out. I gotta get back at it. Swimsuit season's already passed and I'm just behind anyway, so. Um, but. Thank you, guys. And this is, uh, you want to introduce? My silly 154 pound Great Dane would like to ask if you have any questions. <laughs> Big lap dog. Thank you. If you guys uh, want to reach out anytime outside, oh, there he is. that your hand or are you stretching? No, All right. You guys think Kristen's probably the most impressive I would say. Uh, Absolutely. So, um, so I'm a clinician, but I'm also a professor of physical therapy. And with permission, I can say that I, I do talk about Kristen a lot. Um, I, I talk about medical conditions, but I, but I also very much talk about her her spirit and resiliency, and, and it, it's extremely impressive. For all the barriers you can overcome. Oh, yep. Yeah. So, do you talk to other physical therapists that you know about this, and when you do? I, I would like to say we have a, a, a our, our, our chat together on social media, but unfortunately, you know, everybody has their chronic pain is big. The PNE, the uh, pain neuroscience education, is it really big on the forefront? Um, 
but there's no cookie cutter recipe. The research still needs to come out for me to come up here and say, this is what y'all need to be doing. They're gonna say, where's your research to back it up? Uh, I, we unfortunately are treating on an N of one, the person who's in front of us, how they're presenting, and to go and speak, you know, we should all listen, we should all pull on our knowledge. We didn't have a, a cookbook with the Means family, but we, we, we drew in and we collaborated, we, we worked together. Some, some therapists just wanna, you get into tunnel vision. It's like, I can't get this person better. They still have pain, um, but how are they moving? How are they feeling? Your perception of getting better is real. I'm getting better. How do we capture that? And that's why I like how he brought the PSFS out there, the pa uh, patient's functional satisfactory. Patient specific functional yes, scale. Yes, PSF. <laughs> but that can really capture, and, and I know I'm being videoed, but if you use that and you are showing, so it goes from a zero scale. I want to get up the steps without knee pain. Well, I can get up the steps. I got to get up the steps. You're doing it with pain. I'm doing it at like a two. I'm hobbling, I'm crawling up the steps. Instead of like, oh, I'm doing it at an eight. It still hurts but I'm doing it at an eight. I go up those steps that are only like mildly horrible. You know what I mean? Those are steps. Instead, if I, if I hear a therapist, oh, what's your goal? I wanna be at no pain when I go up the steps. If I put that on the goal, I'm not hitting that goal. You guys are out in four weeks, if not sooner. But if we're showing, monitoring, and of one, my patient in front of me is getting better. The almighty insurance company will support that decision. And you have to help us support your improvement. And sometimes it's capturing, um, regressing slower. That's tougher. We don't like to put those goals. I want, I, or staying baseline more. Like what, staying baseline more? Yes, that's a great goal a lot of times. If I can get out of bed with less pain or dread, I, I'm winning, we're winning. Okay, so how do you capture that? And I like that scale where I say, I wanna, how do you, how would you rate your, uh, baseline from last week to this week. Well, I'm still the same, but I feel better about it. That's a win that's very hard to capture. So help us capture that. And that's the communication you should have with your therapist is how to capture that. And we have to do our job and we have to show the insurance company that we are helping you. And that I can't show up, you know, I increased your range of motion. Well, you are, you're hypermobile. <laughs> um, you know, your, your nerve glides got better. Well, what can you do now with that? So that we have to help it with function. I can reach that top cabinet without burning back or neck pain. It still hurts, but it's less, it's more at an eight out of 10 instead of a two out of 10. I just didn't even, have, I made my husband reach and get it <laughs> every time. Now I can, but I don't tell him. He still does it. <laughs> I can vacuum, but my husband's already doing it. So I was like, yeah, don't tell him you're that. Between me and you and the insurance company. <laughs> So to get back to your question, I, I'm going to acknowledge that, that I felt a little uncomfortable when you said it. And, and it's because we don't have this conversation that often with other therapists. And so it's a great question because maybe we should. And, and uh, you know, a lot of, of what you're doing right now is raising awareness. And, um, and, you know, maybe from our aspect, we should be doing a little bit more as well. Absolutely. Good question. I just want to thank you guys for being here and for what you're doing. Um, this was fantastic. It oh, means the world to our patient population. Just to meet people like you with open mind and compassion to help. And like you said, everyone's different. But all these tools and tricks, like, this was wonderful. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Yeah, and use this you. as a resource to the, I'm not saying that what we're doing is the right thing, but to keep in mind with my history of, right. our history of working with you guys, these are the biggest barriers and to help them navigate those waters would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.